If you've ever seen Mel Brooks, The Producers, it was a play and it's a movie. And as is typical of Mel Brooks, it's got its blue humor in it, so I'm not here to endorse it. But I do think its story kind of sets up what we're talking about this morning. In The Producers, you have a Broadway producer, a famous Broadway producer, who's fallen on hard times financially, and his accountant. And his accountant realizes that, you know, you only have to pay investors if a play makes money. If they invest in the play and it doesn't make a profit, you don't pay them anything. So, why don't we find the worst script possible something that's sure to close uh, in a week and you go out and to all your usual donors and raise all these investment dollars to put on this play and over raise millions of dollars way more than we need to put the play on and then when it closes we won't have to pay them any of that money back. We'll just get rich off of it. And so they set out to do that. And they, they begin scouring all the plays that people submit, hoping that they will get produced. And they find the absolute worst, most offensive play. Let me put this up here because that's what they want. They want to see the marquee say closed on their play. They they find th this offensive play that is going to be so offensive that no one will want to come see it. It's called Springtime for Hitler. And it's a musical. <laughs> and they, <laughs> they go and they hire one of the worst directors they know who thinks he's the bee's knees of theater. And they cast this overacting, arrogant actor in the lead role. And all of this is sure to combine to make the thing close in less than a week. And then they will be rich. So they go off to celebrate. Opening night, they don't even, they don't even stay for the rest of the performance. And, and the performance up to intermission is offending people. People are leaving and, uh, and comments are being made in the theater. And so the two producers go off to a bar and they toast to their success that's wrapped up in their failure. <laughs> and everyone in the play, everyone involved, cast and crew, and anybody who does theater is happy to have anything to do with a Broadway production. I mean, that's that's the crest, you know, you're riding the crest when you're in Broadway. So they're all thrilled to be a part of it, but they don't realize they have been set up to fail. Set up to fail. As the story goes on, things turn at intermission. The bad actor starts hamming it up and the crowd loves it and the thing turns into a big hit, but <laughs> they were set up to fail. That's what we want to consider this morning because it could be, it could be thought that Isaiah was being set up to fail. As we read his interaction with God where God is calling him to the ministry that he would have. So we pick up in verse 8, we saw last week Isaiah was standing in the presence of the Lord. He saw the Lord high and lifted up. His train filled the temple. And now the Lord speaks to him after Isaiah has confessed that he's sinful, he doesn't belong there. And the angel has brought the, the hot burning coal with tongs from the altar, touched his lips and purged him of his sin. And now the Lord speaks. Verse 8. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Notice that. Whom shall I send and who will go for us? 
Now, scholars love to look at something like that and say, well, that looks like it's talking about God in a plurality, but it's some kind of a royal plural that means singular. And I, I don't know why evangelical scholars go there. I, I, I think this is a reference to the Trinity here. Because he says, if it just said us, then it could be all that, all that linguistic stuff that scholars know more about than I do. But, uh, but he says, whom shall I send, singular, who will go for us? And that he is linking the us with the I. When he's just said the I, why does he need the plural? I believe it's a reference to the triune God. Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And then I said, here I am, send me. So far, so good. And he said, go and say to this people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy, and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. <laughs> Go talk to people who aren't going to hear a word you say, and maybe some scholars would say they aren't going to be able to hear a word that you say, because they're not chosen. We'll get into that a little bit, and I won't solve the issue for you, but we'll unpack it a little bit uh, at one, as we go through this. But um, verse 11, then I said, how long, O Lord? And he said, until cities lie waste without inhabitant and houses without people and the land is desol a desolate waste. And the Lord removes people far away and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. And though a tenth remain in it, it will be burned again, like a terebinth or an oak whose stump remains when it is felled. The holy seed is its stump. Whoa, wait a second, Lord. I mean, if you're going to send me out from your very throne room, no less, can't you, like, put me in a pulpit with, you know, a supersized congregation and multiple campuses and a radio ministry and a TV ministry and a book ministry and a conference ministry and and they even had me on CNN to talk about social issues and I mean can't you give me that Lord no you go to people who aren't going to listen to a word you say and so we look at that and we ask was Isaiah being set up to fail was God setting Isaiah up to fail? Does God set us up to fail would be our next question. And I would say the answers are no and no. It was not being set up to fail. But you say, but it's right there in the text. Go Isaiah, speak to these people and your ministry is going to be a failure. Right, that's what it looks like, doesn't it? And it is true that he is being sent to a hard-hearted nation that is not going to listen to him. The words are going to fall on deaf ears. And from our perspective, we might say, why even go? Why even bother if you know this isn't going to uh, accomplish anything? There's not going to be any fruit born from this, it seems. So why? Why send Isaiah on the mission if the mission is destined for failure. And I would just say I'm I mean I could come up I could come up with reasons, but the ultimate reason is this, and this is something as we follow the Lord, we need to grasp. I, I think we're always trying to explain everything and smooth everything over so that God looks and sounds exactly the way we have imagined them to be in our minds ways that don't grate against our sensitivities as 21st century Americans. And, and we filter everything through three words in the Bible, God is love. And so everything has to be 
love the way we define love. And so I will answer these questions in a way that, that we really need to get to as followers of the Lord. And why would God send Isaiah on such a mission, which would suggest that he could send us on such missions as well? Why would God do that? And the answer to that resides in the mind of God. It resides in the mind of God. Whose ways and thoughts are not our ways and thoughts. We're forever trying to define God in accordance with our thoughts and our ways. But he tells us very plainly in this very book, chapter 55, 8 and 9, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. You know I quote this all the time. So there it is in front of your eyes. <laughs> My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Plain as day. We cannot miss that. Plain as day. So we have this tendency to try to serve God by our own will and our own wisdom which if, if we had a, a, a church that was wanting to send out a team to maybe plant a, a, a church in a, in a region and we looked at the region being the way God has described these people here we would say well that's a big colossal waste of time let's not go there that makes sense to us that makes absolute sense to us and, and you can have one person in that committee saying, but you know, look where God sent Isaiah. And look, you know, look how God pulled Philip away from a revival and sent him to talk to one guy in the desert. And, and, and yet the committee would probably say, yeah, I know, but those are aberrations. We, we are smart business people here, and we, we need to do what's going to work, what's going to see results. Because God, doesn't God want us to bear fruit? You know, if you want to throw in a biblical context for it. And, and I understand how the human mind works that way. And yet we find God not working according to our wisdom. <laughs> again and again and again in the scriptures. So we have a tendency to try to serve God by our own will and wisdom. But as we look at Isaiah's calling here and the conversation he has with God about that call, I want to point out three insights into serving God His way. Not our way, but serving God His way. And one insight into serving God His way is that God seeks willing hearts to answer His call. Now that, everyone would say, Amen. Amen. Yeah, we... We get that. It's the only one of the three I think we get. <laughs> but that's what we have here with Isaiah. Um, God doesn't send out a pre-programmed robot. He picks a person out of humanity and he says, who will go for me? And the person says, I will go. I will go. A willing participant. I recently attended a five-day seminar on uh, God raising up artists in the world today. Rise Up Christian Artists, I think the seminar was called. Now, I don't paint pictures or anything like that. I do write songs. I like to play and sing songs. That's art. And I also write. I'm a writer and have always been told I should be a writer. Rosalie's been nagging. Thank nagging me nagging. for years and, uh, and and believe me she's not the first <laughs> there's, there's a chorus of people always in my head you should write and so uh, I attended this seminar and uh, and the Lord used it to fire me up and so I am pursuing those things um, and we'll see where they might go but one thing that this guy the, the instructor he's a very successful basket artist. He makes baskets. He lives in Asheville, North Carolina, which is a place 
that I've always wanted to live, that particular city. I have looked at house prices there, and I, I mean, I almost went to college there because I, I, I love Asheville. So he lives in Asheville, and they have an arts community there. And I just, I just put up one of his, uh, one of his works. So uh, that's for a fireplace mantle. He does a lot of that kind of thing. I mean, look at the multiple baskets that are on there, and he makes all of those. He makes them. He goes out and picks up stuff off the ground in the woods and whatnot and makes baskets. He doesn't order straw from a, from a manufacturer. He goes out and gets stuff that has fallen off of trees or that's, that's growing in fields and makes baskets out of them along with the branch. Now, he is so renowned and he goes to fine arts festivals and things that he is at a place, he charges 75 to $100 an hour to make something like that. And you think, oh, I can go to Walmart and get one of those for $19.99. <laughs> well, you're not going to get it $19.99 from him because the way you're buying from him is uh, a work of art and he treats it like I'm an artist and so people will pay if this thing takes him 10 hours to make he said some of these take 10 hours to make he's looking it up to a thousand dollars to sell that thing and so here's a guy who started off saying I'm gonna make these baskets and I'm gonna sell them for twenty dollars a piece at flea markets and things and then he uh, he just began following the Lord and turning it into trying to make nickels and dimes into art to where he now gets invited to fine art shows and, and whatnot. So I'm listening to this guy, not because I might be able to charge $75 to $100 an hour, but because this is a guy who for the Lord, and boy, he's all about the Lord. He's all about kingdom living, he talks about a lot. And, and so I'm listening. And I took notes, and I was there all five days on time, looked at all the extra stuff and everything, learning from him. Well, one thing that he stressed, out of all the things he said, one thing that he stressed was God is not looking for your perfection. God is not looking for you to figure everything out. God is not looking for you to know all the ins and outs. I mean, you learn that stuff as you go. But God is looking for your yes. If God is calling you, what he's looking for from you is your yes. And that, that, really, that really struck me. That's what God got from Isaiah, is yes. Isaiah doesn't know how he's going to go do all this, but God said, who will go for me? And Isaiah said, I will. Yes, Lord. So one of the things I did, I thought it would be fun to show this. I'm a little embarrassed now that it's on here, but... Uh, for the homework assignments, I made a video of myself struggling with all the voices that come into my head as I think about trying to be a writer. And then the Lord whispered, will you, you, will you serve me with the gifts, the talents that I've given you? Hopefully you'll be able to hear all that. It's like a minute and a half, so I thought it'd be fun to play it. My work's not as good as everyone else's. I can't let anybody see this yet. It, it's not perfect. Who do you think you are? It's not like you're famous or something. <laughs> you're not an artist. You're just some guy who does stuff. I'm afraid no one will like it. But they might laugh. But what if they laugh? Why would anyone want to see me? But what if I try and, and I only embarrass myself? Why would anyone want to hear me? But what if it isn't any good? I'm just a loser. Why do I even try? Why do I even try? happen to have the 
this verse in it. <laughs> so, but anyway, I don't know. Um, so, does anybody, does that ring true for anybody? <laughs> that kind of thing? God seeks willing hearts to answer his call. Here am I, Lord, send me. That's what Isaiah said. And so Isaiah showed that he had a willing heart. Here's an interesting thing. In the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 7 and verse 10, uh, chapter 7, that's where Daniel's getting, sees a vision of the Ancient of Days and the Son of Man coming in the clouds and whatnot. But around the throne, he says, a thousand thousand served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. Ten thousand times ten thousand, and you can check it out on your phone's calculator, is a hundred million. That's a whole lot of sinless, angelic beings standing at the ready to go and do whatever God wants done. And he picks us. He does. I don't know why he does. But I do know that when you see it in this context, you say, wow, that's a privilege. That's a privilege that God would choose us to go and do his work. It's a high privilege. And so I would ask, are you willing? The Lord calls. Are you willing? I mean, he, he's, all, he's always calling in some sense if nothing more specific than just living out this word in the eyes of, of the world around us to represent him in this world. So God seeks willing hearts to answer his call and then a second insight into serving God his way is that one's call may feel like talking to a wall. <laughs> you ever feel like you're talking to a wall? You're talking and you can see in somebody's eyes they're miles away. It's like you're talking to the wall. Or I think parents use that a lot with their kids. How many times do I have to tell you? It's like talking to a wall. Tell you it's like, it's like a wall, you know. Well, sometimes ministry, ministry can be like that. And so we see in... Isaiah's case, verse 9, and he said, Go and say to this people, Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull, and their ears heavy, and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. God was pretty clear that the prospect that lay before Isaiah would be like, talking to a wall. I think it's normal to imagine big things. I was talking about, yeah, Lord, wouldn't you put me you know, in a pulpit? In my... And boy, believe me, I've gone through all of that stuff. I've been open about going through all of that stuff uh, in my own heart. I, I, it's natural, but natural ultimately is a thing of the flesh, right? <laughs> and so... And so, uh, um, it might be natural, but it's, it's never right to question God and God's wisdom. It can be discouraging to learn that a call from God is not uh, something where, where you're going to see all this fruit being born, even if you don't want it for fame, even if you don't want it because uh, people give you strokes all the time, you know, or, or financial gain or something. Even if, you, even if you just love seeing the body of Christ alive and, and the church growing and stuff like that, um, even, if, even if you desire that kind of thing for noble reasons, and then God has other things in mind, and it can be discouraging because you've set up in your mind the way things are going to be. How could Isaiah preach with unction? <laughs> I, 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 could, I could easily see somebody saying, okay, Lord, I'll do this, and then just go out and go through the motions. I'm going to say the right words, and 
And I'm going to say I'm like, uh, yeah, you know, Jesus died for you and you need to believe on him. And in my mind, I say, yeah, right, like anybody's going to do that in this day and age, the way our country's going. You know, you start thinking things like that and, and approaching the work of the Lord in that way. That, that made me think of, of uh, Willy Wonka. If you've seen the Willy Wonka movie, the great one with Gene Wilder, uh, stop, don't, come back. This is where they're in the TV room and the kid is wanting to become part of the particles that, you know, he wants to be turned into a TV character. But along the way, he has said that, you know, there's a girl who's going to eat something, it could be harmful for her, and he's tried to warn everybody, and the parents aren't listening, the kids aren't, so he's like, stop, don't, you know, and he has that kind of look on his face. It's like, stop, don't, okay, I told you, you're not going to listen to me, but I warned you. And, you know, we can do ministry like that, can't we? <laughs> um, we can fall into that. And uh, we don't want to do that. Did Isaiah do that? Get Willy Wonka off here. I don't know if that's Isaiah, but it is Hebrew text, so I thought it would be a cool picture to put up there. Because we don't want Willy Wonka up there for the next two or three minutes, but uh, during the middle of the message. But um, Isaiah is 66 chapters of proclaiming the Word of God with them and vigor and heart and, and in the power of the Spirit and with all the warning he can muster and and all to the glory of God. And we can tell how people are going to respond from the way God said they would respond, and yet Isaiah doesn't let up. He goes out and does the work of God, even though it's like talking to a wall. Now, I want to address this issue just briefly, because, you know, some people point out, well, these are active verbs here in verses 9 and 10. Keep on hearing, but don't understand. Keep on seeing, but don't perceive. And so some people want to translate it. Isaiah, go and talk to a people who aren't going to listen to you. And, but others say, God is like guaranteeing this is going to happen, and these are very active verbs. So God is saying, go and talk to a people whom I have predestined not to listen to you. And that would be the more reformed Calvinist side of things. I always come down in the middle. I believe, I believe from God's perspective that kind of thing probably does go on because God is sovereign. And God isn't waiting to see who's going to come to faith. So I personally don't have a problem with God being sovereign and ordaining and electing. But from a human perspective, I look at it and the scripture calls for people to respond and you know and things like that and so somehow here we stand trying to look at it from our perspective but trying to understand from God's perspective we say those two things are contradictory but they're contradictory within this little box of creation that we live in and and what constitutes logic within this sphere uh, within this dimension we might say uh, from from God's perspective, both things can be true. And I think this could actually be taken both ways. Keep on hearing, but don't understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull. I mean, Isaiah doesn't have the power to do this, so I don't know where, why people always say that God is, this is saying God's going to do it. He's telling Isaiah, go ahead and make the heart of the people dull. I mean, that could just as easily be, go and preach the truth to people who don't want it, and they're going to they're gonna fall asleep on you. So, if, if, if the word makes them fall asleep, then go give them the word and make them fall asleep with it. So, you know, I can see this going both ways. I, um, this is used, this passage is used when Jesus talks about why he talks in parables. And he uses uh, the end of verse 10 there, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. And so there it sounds like Jesus is intentionally uh, 
telling, preaching the word in ways that some people are not going to get it, and kids sound like because he doesn't want them to get it. I don't know. God is God. And I think it's way above my pay grade. I, I do know this, that Jesus goes on to tell the disciples, but you, you, you basically, they come to him at that point and say, what does this mean? And I can't remember the exact wording of it, but, uh, but maybe the people who wouldn't even bother to say, what does this mean? Jesus is weeding those people out. Because they don't want to know the truth. So once again, it could go either way. But from God's perspective, it's never going to surprise God. It's never going to go the way God doesn't want it to go. Uh, ultimately, in the course of things, the way he has ordained things. And so, I leave that to God. And I, and I, I think it was Spurgeon who said, um, when you get to the gate of heaven... The sign on the door says, Whosoever will may come. And when you pass through and you turn and look at the sign over the door from inside, from heaven's perspective, said, Chosen from the foundations of the world. Hmm. And so, I, I live in that sphere on these issues. So I'll just throw that out there for you. Either way, God sends them a messenger. And so they're without excuse. Right. They get the message. So they're without excuse. And maybe that's what Isaiah's role is. Um, I've sometimes wondered if that's my role. <laughs> Not that I'm putting myself on the level of Isaiah. I just, in my little meager portion of humanity, you know, <laughs> to say, okay, there you go. Now you're without excuse. <laughs> I don't know. God knows these things. Um, it's not ours to determine if someone is chosen. It's not ours to determine if someone has passed the point of no return in their rejection of the Lord again and again and again and again. That their hearts are now so hard that the seed will never penetrate it. And that does happen to people. It's not ours to determine that. Those are details that belong to God. Like I said, way above our pay grade. All we can do is be faithful. And even if we're left feeling like we're talking to a wall, to still be faithful. Still be faithful. So if God seeks willing hearts to answer his call, and one's call may feel like talking to a wall, but the word must go forth till judgment should fall. Notice how I turn that into rhymes. It's all the right syllables and everything. To hopefully make it kind of sing in your heart. <laughs> the word must go forth till judgment should fall. So Isaiah says, verse 11, How long, O Lord? And he says, and he talks about judgment. Isaiah, it's like Isaiah saying, How long? How long do I go and talk to this wall? And God says, uh, until cities lie waste without inhabitant, and houses without people, and the land is a desolate waste. And the Lord removes people far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. He's talking about the judgment here that would, would come upon the land. And they'd be carried off into exile. Keep preaching. How long do I talk to this wall, Lord, until there's no longer a wall there? Yeah, just keep. You just keep getting the word out. The word keeps going forward. You never say, well, this is a lost cause. Everything is crumbling. It's time to fold the tent. And, and just wait for the Lord to come back, you know. It, it's, we, we just keep going until judgment should fall. And when judgment falls, when God is bringing down the curtain on history, then, then there's no more speaking to be done. In fact, we won't even be here to be doing the speaking. But the word, the word must go forth till judgment should fall. Um, and, and in fact, it'd be easy for Isaiah to, to look and, and say, Man, this whole thing's falling apart. It's time to get out of Dodge. And yet, God says, And though a tenth remain in it, verse 13, it will be burned again, like a terebinth or an oak whose stump remains when it is felled. The holy seed is its stump. He's talking there very picturesquely. The, the stump that remains of a tree, eventually 
branches start growing, we've got a stump in our yard that that happens to. It starts wanting to come back again. And it, it's the remnant. The remnant that turns up again and again and again in the Old Testament. God has his remnant. Israel is never eradicated. They're never erased from the face of the earth. Because God has an eternal covenant with them. And he will not go back on his word. Now, if you were told you're hired to tear down this dilapidated brick wall, and the owner says, get it out of here, I want to put a garden there or something, just the bricks aren't even good, nobody's going to buy those. They look at it, it's broken down, condemned. Just throw them in a dumpster, haul them to the dump, whatever. Just get it out of here. And yet, right about here, what you don't know is what the weather has done over time. It's kind of blended, it's one brick in, so that it looks like all the others. But what's really underneath there? is a gold brick. And that's a very bad picture. I tried so hard to get that right, but I just want to make the point. And, the, and when all that gets cleaned off, there's like a solid gold brick in there. And if you knew that, if you knew that, would you just give up on this wall and break it down like the owner hired you to do and throw it in a dumpster and let it get hauled off to the dump? No, you'd still be saying, no, there's there's a good brick in there. There's a good brick in there. There's a really good brick in there. Better than any of the other bricks were when they were brand new because it's made of solid gold. And that's what the remnant is. The, re the remnant is, they might even look like the rest of the nation uh, to look at them from a distance. And yet God knows who they are. God knows their hearts. And, and I think maybe Isaiah preaching all the way to the end is to reach the remnant. Because you could say, well, God keeps the remnant, so God's going to take care of it. But how does, how does God get the hearts of people? He gets it through the mouths of other people who have said, here am I, send me. Who have said, yes, Lord. And so Isaiah, God has a remnant and he's not going to lose that remnant, but how is he going to reach that remnant? He's going to reach it through a messenger who brings his word to them. And so maybe that's why Isaiah keeps preaching and preaching and preaching to the end. And we would be called to the same thing. I mean, you never know. You just never know. The bombs could be falling. <laughs> and you never know that somebody's right on the precipice. They're five seconds away from getting it and surrendering to the Lord. We don't know these things. So, so we don't try to figure all that out and plot it and plan it and graph it and say, uh, well, we should, we should quit here and go here. And if God has said, preach here, then we trust him and we do it his way. And we keep going. God keeps his word going forth as long as there are people in this world. And even the strictest view of election, elect from the before the foundations of the earth, and there's no way this person cannot get saved because they're elect, God is still going to use a human instrument to reach them. And if you're called to be that instrument, then do that work. And we are all called in some sense. Some in more obvious, dramatic, vocational senses maybe. But everyone who knows the Lord is called to represent the Lord. To be a witness for Jesus. So Isaiah becomes that instrument in this text to reach the remnant. And our sharing of the gospel and obedience to our Lord even when it seems to reach no one is reaching 
the ones who belong to the Lord and don't know it yet. So we've seen three insights here into serving God His way. Like I said, we're pretty good with the first one, right? God seeks willing hearts to answer His call. There's no argument with that. We echo Isaiah's words. Here am I, send me, even if we chicken out in the aftermath of saying it. We, we know that's the right thing to say. And our hearts desire, Lord, here am I, send me, and kick me out the door if I'm hesitating. Fill me with power, not only with power, but with boldness to go and do your will. Then we start designing by our own wisdom and experience what we will do for God. And that's where we start losing it. Yeah, it, it's, not that, it's not that things that make sense and experience that people bring to the table is to be ignored. It's just that we don't turn down a clear direction from the Lord that seems to go against what people bring to the table. It seems to be way out of our comfort zone, and way out of our abilities, because it's not about our abilities anyway. And so if the Lord is leading, this is why the business mentality for the church that is so based on how Wall Street does things and successful businesses and stuff like that doesn't work because the Bible is filled with situations where God would say, go here and do this and what? Really? Really, Lord? <laughs> you know, and if you're sitting around a boardroom table doing what makes sense based on how, what our resources are and the experiences of the people at the table or the experiences of someone we know in the church and we can do this and accomplish that, man, we got it going on this, just get the thing in place and let it run, you know. I'm not saying that's always the wrong thing to do, but it's but it's always the wrong thing to turn down the thing that requires faith because it's too hard or too risky. And so we come and we try to do the easy thing, the thing that makes the most sense to our human wisdom. It doesn't make sense to us that we should talk when no one is listening, that we should just preach to the wall. It doesn't make sense. Or when things start to look irredeemable, man, it's done here, it's all falling apart, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. But the results are up to God. The results are up to God. They're not... They're not up to our ability to figure it out and plot it and put all the right people in the right places. We do that kind of thing the best of our ability and and yet if we're not doing it prayerfully, if we're doing it prayerfully, God is going to upset that apple cart sometimes and we need to go with that. Um, results are up to God. So if we're preaching and no one's responding, well, if we're preaching the truth, we're doing the right thing. The results are up to God. Ours is to obey. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord, that no matter what we are involved in, we can always say, you've got this. Lord, we thank you that with the angelic hosts at your disposal you choose to use us I don't understand that even that doesn't make sense from a business perspective <laughs> and yet Lord you don't function by the business minds of men so Lord I pray that um, we would just be prayerfully walking with you our hearts attuned to you and your ways, your word, and the leading of your spirit. May we walk by faith, just being obedient to the call, leaving the results to you. We know that there will be things that we never saw with our own eyes that we will celebrate in heaven because of it all.
We thank you for that hope. In Jesus' name.